You go. Yeah. Oh, hang on. I gotta. What do I gotta do? Make sure you're good to go. Now I gotta press a thing here. Okay. You good? Yeah. All right. Well, hi Graham. Welcome back. Hey Brian. To part two. Now, now in part one, if I can, if I can just remind you, in part one, we talked a lot about how you got started playing bass and how you played guitar initially, and uh, some of your earlier bands and some some of your early inspirations. And we we cut it off just at the moment where you were about to tell us about how you met Joe Jackson. Right. And so we want to pick it up from there. Sure. So um, I had seen this odd, skinny, gangly guy with stringy blonde hair at concerts. I, you know, there was a really great concert hall uh, in Portsmouth, and, and I went there so many times to see some great shows. You know, it was one of those, it was the venue where everyone went to see the national act, you know. Right. But we saw everyone from Genesis to um, King Crimson. Uh, I saw the Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon tour. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. incredible. So, and I would see this guy, you know, and we'd always kind of look at each other across the room. Kind of, I, this, is how, this is how I remember it. Anyway, we'd yeah. look at each other and we're like, who are you, you know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> who the fuck are you? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, um, so probably in like 1973 or four, I forget it, probably 73, um, he, he had joined a cover band in Portsmouth. And um, he was actually studying music at the Royal Academy of Music in London, which was a prestigious music school, one of the most prestigious music yeah. schools. Um, and, but he was a student, so he was broke. So he joined this local cover band. He'd come home at the weekends and do gigs with this cover band. So he did that for a few months. And then the guys that started the band, who were old, much older, probably in their thirties or forties, decided they were gonna hang it up for whatever reason, you know, pressure from their wives or who knows. Yeah. So Joe said to them, well, can I keep the band going even though you're not in it? And they said, sure, you know, knock your socks off. So then Joe was looking for people to, to repopulate the band. Yeah. And he had a couple of friends that he called in, a friend of ours called Mark Andrews was the lead singer. Joe wasn't the lead singer, he was the keyboard player. And he must have known about me. I can only assume from seeing me. Uh, he said he saw me at a gig, but I had no idea what what gig what, what gig it was. And it shocks me that he would. <laughs> it shocks me that he would have been impressed enough yeah. to want me to be in a band. That's with him. nice. Yeah, and I can't tell you how shitty <clears throat> my early bands were. But anyway, so one day, you know, the doorbell rings, and my mother comes up to my room, and she says, "This is odd, strange looking." Bella at the door wants to speak to you, you know. So yeah, I'm still living with my parents, you know. So I come down and there's there's that guy I'd seen at concerts, you know. So uh, he comes in and asks me to join this band, you know. And he explains, well, you know, there's work. The band's got work, and um, you know we can probably make some money at the weekends. And tells me that he's a music student, so the gigs would mostly be at weekends. And would I like to meet the other guys and decide if I want to do it? So. That's, uh, that's exactly what I did. Very nice. And then we started gigging and, um, and you know, we were, it, it was not an easy time to be in a, in a band if you had any ambitions whatsoever. And, and what, it makes Graham, me, <clears throat> Graham what, what, what year are we talking about here? Is this like 76? Oh, this, this, this was in the disco days, <clears throat> okay, yeah. mid seventies. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, but, but we, we would sneak an original song in here and there, you know, yeah. And um, we 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 got better as well. You know, we we improved. We we got a better drummer, and uh, we you know, there, there was the, the the lead singer Mark was writing songs. Joe was writing songs, and we you know we were we were really trying hard. And uh, I actually thought we were we were good, and we were getting better. We found a manager. We finally got a little record deal. Um, wow, which was good, but the deal was sort of a provisional deal where we'll let you make three singles and if the singles do okay then we'll let you do an album right and uh, so we recorded we and we actually had a producer and we recorded at a couple of good uh, london studios 
um, including Air Studios, which mm -hmm. we all know about because that was George Martin's new studio. And um, and I, I remember we were recording at Air and the, the, the room we were in was right across from the room that Jeff Beck's Blow by Blow had been recorded in. Great album. I remember wow. we, all, we all kind of went over there. It was like going into a, a, a sacred you know, yes. like a sacred space or something, you know. So we were very impressed by that to be, you know, just to, to feel like some connection with greatness. Yeah. And um, so all three of our singles bombed and the record label dropped us. Joe was so disgusted that he left the band and that it felt like we had a we had a break and 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 it didn't work out and that was it. All right. And um, I was so disheartened. I remember I sold my I, I had bought a brand new jazz bass. Uh, that was my pride and joy. And I was so, I, I, th I really, I, I must have thought. This is it. it. Yeah. And I, I sold it and I just went back to my day job. I was like a school gr groundskeeper. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I kind of like gave up on the whole thing for about two months. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, and then another, a, 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 a guy called Dave Houghton, who was in one of the really good local bands, asked me to join an, his new band. And so I had to go out and buy a new bass because I didn't actually have a bass. And um, Dave ended up being Joe's drummer because Joe, um, after he left the band that we were in together, he had begun writing songs in earnest and demoing them. Um, he was, Joe was working at the local Playboy Club and backing up cabaret artists to make some money. And he used all the money to make demos wow. of his new songs. And Dave, my new bandmate, Dave Houghton, who was a phenomenal drummer. And I was, that, that's the only reason I bought a new bass is because I was so excited to work with him. Um, we, 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 uh, we ended up playing on Joe's demos and those demos were what got Joe his record contract a couple of years ago. Oh, Wow. Well, well, go, getting getting back to Dave, I've I've mentioned this several times, but Dave, Dave is one of my one of my all time favorite drummers. You know, he's such a great, very musical, and you guys as a rhythm section were phenomenal. You know, yeah, yeah. You know how that happens rarely, but when it happens, you know, you you play with someone and you just like lock in. Yeah, and it just feels like you're, you know, you're. You're, you're the pair of shoes, you know, that, that, yeah. that makes the whole thing move, you know, anyway. Um, yeah, he's great. He's great. And, um, and, and so we were, yeah, we were rhythm section for quite a few years there, maybe five years. So <clears throat> tell us, tell us about the early days though. So does, does Joe get a record deal? Are, are you guys playing clubs, um, opening for other bands? Uh, how, how does this all work out? Is it just the three of you? You have, you have no, a guitar player. No, there was a guitar player too that Joe brought in. Um, he, he imagined it as a four piece with him, you know, Joe standing, <clears throat> front, Joe being the lead singer, standing, you know, fronting the band and gotcha. then, then running over and playing the occasional keyboard solo. Gotcha. So there was a guitar player called Gary Sanford. And um, when we, we made our first album, we, we literally, you know, Joe had, uh, Joe's demos ended up in the right hands and um, he, he, his demos were heard by a, a, a guy called David Kirschenbaum, who in 1978 was in London looking, scouting for A&M Records for quote unquote new wave talent. And he heard Joe's demos um, and wanted to sign him on the spot. And it was really within just a few weeks, we went from uh, uh, nothing to Joe calling me to telling me I could quit my day job to being in a top-notch recording studio in London called Eden mm -hmm. and recording <laughs> an album in a week or less than a week. Was was uh, what were the songs? Uh, what were the demoed songs that that got him signed? And they were any, basically the same, the, the very same songs that are on the, the look, his first look sharp. Album look sharp right yeah. it's the same songs yeah in fact joe's original intention was just to find someone to release the demos right. as they were <clears throat> right but actually it was a good decision to re-record them because they you know that they needed a little polishing and yeah. they definitely got that and um how about yeah. um so is she really going out with him 
was was yeah. one of the demos too. That's, that was yeah. one of them. Yeah. And uh, was that was that the first single? By it was the, the first way? single, and it yeah. was a hit. It was a hit yeah. right away. And we were, we we did play clubs in London. We 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 played there were a few clubs like uh, the Hope and Anchor, which was a pub in London that all the punk bands were playing at. And there was another place called the Nashville Room. Mm -hmm. um, and we we had actually had re kind of like a residency at those mm -hmm. two places. So we'd play every week um, at those places once a week. And then we were doing other gigs. We we got an opening spot on a tour. A national tour that ran for a few weeks in late 1978 and by the time we finished that tour our single was in the top 20 in england wow and the band we were opening for was less well known than we were yeah which wow. was very very weird for everybody that's so um, great and then um and and the the the, the music press in britain review we got just glowing reviews for the first album right instantly and you yeah. know you couldn't you couldn't have scripted it better really um and then uh within a few months we went on our first u.s tour in the beginning of 79 and uh, we were playing clubs but we were uh yeah we were ecstatic because we were on a real tour bus and we were you know living the dream you wow know? so you guys were really doing it you know we were really yeah. doing it. just kind of it all happened incredibly quickly. I'd like um, you to talk. So, so I, I'm, I've, when I was, when your first album came out, I was working at a restaurant in Dover, New, New Jersey as a summer, that was my summer job. And I remember hearing, you know, I listened to the radio all day. I was working in the kitchen and the songs were great. I really loved Joe's songs, but your bass playing has a certain representation. You know, it was it, it's put forth in the in those recordings in such a way that you're featured. Like you you are featured. The drums are featured, sure, but the bass is very very prominent. And so, can you speak to that? Can you give us some context? Um, was it intentional? Did it just happen? How did the pick? How did the picking come about? Um, and like give us give us all that stuff so before the record deal ever happened um after joe left the band that that we had been in where, where we had the, the record deal that didn't work out and joe left the band and and uh, we we had stayed in touch and i knew he was writing songs and every now and again he'd invite me over to play me some of the songs and we started demoing the songs but around that time i remember him telling me his concept for his band and his concept for his band was he wanted the bass to be the featured instrument. Wow. And he said, he said the world is sick of guitar solos. He said, the guitar is just going to be a rhythm instrument and you're going to be like up front in, 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 the, in the construction and presentation of the songs. Oh, how, do you, how do you feel about that? And I'm like, <laughs> pretty good, actually. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> so um, that's that's how it started, and then when we started, the, but the other thing was was kind of like accidental, really, because I had been using flat wound strings, and I'd been using the Fender Bassman amp with the treble turned up because I liked the way it sounded. Now I'd been yeah. using a pick, and I used a pick for two reasons. One was I liked the sound of it, but the other reason was I'm not very fa fast. With my, my fingers, fingers yeah. I'm, really, I'm just not that fast. So some of the songs, especially some of the newer ones he was presenting, I was like, there's no way I could play that with my fingers. Yeah. So I just used a pick. And so in, in it, the, 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 the idea of the bass being up front was completely intentional and planned. And, uh, but, but the sound was, was kind of a happy accident because that was the sound I had at the time. And when we went in the studio in 78 and recorded Look Sharp, um, the the producer picked up on that right away, and he he um, yeah he encouraged it and and kind of mixed the record was mixed with that completely in mind. You know? That's so great. I mean, thank thank goodness, right? Because if if it, if it were another producer, oh the 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 bass can't be featured, right? I mean, somebody could have like kiboshed it, you know, the vision. Somebody could have, you know, I know. You know. I, it really could have, it, it could have gone either way. But the, uh, 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 to David Kirschenbaum's credit, he 
he recognized the strengths of the songs and the songwriting. And he actually didn't want to change too much about the demos. Yeah. He really didn't. He just wanted them to sound more polished. Um, and instead of a, a, a Fender Rhodes, you know, there was a real electric, uh, there was a real, sorry, a real grand piano. Right. Um, you know, things like that. So, yeah. um, but um, I, I think, you know, I mean, if you could hear those demos, you'd realize that not a lot was changed in terms of arrangements. It was really just in terms of the sound. The do, you, do you do you do you still have in your personal collection those demos? Are are they on cassette tape or? Yeah, I, I actually <laughs> took the I, I took the precaution of bouncing them to digital format. Oh, smart! Yeah, they, but they still sound very analog because unfortunately the tapes were a lot of hiss deteriorated but yeah. but you can still hear them you know yeah I, I listen to them every now and again there's a couple of songs that didn't make it i get a kick out of listening to those nice. i know no one will ever hear those yeah so, you why know. don't you tell us you you told me a story once of and this is the first i had heard of it and later playing you know professionally uh i i got used to punching in but you told me a story where the whole band punched in on one of Joe's songs. Oh, it was on Look Sharp. It was yeah. on the song Look Sharp. And since you brought it up, I can you can hear the punch. You can but definitely hear it. Yeah. yeah. But before that, I mean, maybe look, can, can we just assume that there are some people listening that maybe are not familiar with um, what punching in is, number one, but also right. um, would you say, would you agree that punching in the, the entire band, even though it's doable, it would, would be kind of rare, right? Oh Would yeah, you, definitely. Uh, Although I have done it since then. Yeah, but, you and, know they they always say that the hardest thing to punch in is drums because there's always things that are ringing like cymbals. Yes. That, so a punch in would be ideal in a spot where there's dead silence. Just to, even if a split second, you could do it. So so can you yeah tell tell us about it and and um, maybe may, maybe explain to some folks what 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 the punch what the concept of the punch is you know well the the the, the song in question looks sharp there's a little drum solo to, uh, in the middle of the song uh, it, and and it's tricky you know it's got a tricky little bass drum part and dave played it dave could play it in his sleep but because we were in a recording studio i think maybe he he psyched himself out and he didn't he didn't play it quite as well as he you know the, the other nine times out of ten so the producer said, how about we punch that in? And Dave said, okay, so punching in means, you know, you, you stop the recording at a certain point and you pick it up live, you know? So usually punching in is, is an individual person like the, mm -hmm. the bass player or, or the vocalist or something. And it's very common practice, but to punch a whole band in is, is pretty risky. It's, it's risky, you know, yeah. and, uh, especially if, if you've got, Two thirds of a really great take. You're taking a risk that you might ruin that if this yeah. doesn't work out. But we did it, and um, you know, you've got me thinking about it. I don't know if it was a punch in or if it was an edit. Oh I wow! Think it might have just been an edit. Now I'm thinking about it. But I, what I do remember is that the tempos of the two edits were not because we weren't playing to a click track. Yeah. So the tempos were there was a, a very tiny variation, and I think that the, the 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 cut they used they cut it yeah the, yeah it was a cut that the, the, they used a different track that was very slightly faster uh -huh. and i noticed it straight away and and when you know they spliced it together so they take the tape and they cut it and then they join it together you know and i mean and it, most people wouldn't notice it but i felt like it was very obvious at the time and the song goes at that point the song goes right into a piano like a piano riff right um joe yeah, plays these so. uh like quarter note triplet things you know before he goes back to his vocal right? i think so yeah i'd yeah. have to listen to it again but yeah <clears throat> I mean, it, it it's it's a definite moment in the song and uh, there's a lot a, a lot changes at that moment and yeah i just remember thinking well we're in a professional studio well, let's just record the whole track again you know yeah. what do you have to do because i remember thinking everyone's it seemed really obvious to me and i thought everyone would notice that but Time goes by, and I listen to it now, and I don't always notice it myself. So. Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, I don't think I, the the tempo differentiation. I don't think I ever picked up on 
I'm sure oh, if I go back and listen to it now, go back and listen, you'll hear it. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, um, but that was one of those things. We you know we'd never done anything like that before. We'd never, well, even though we'd been in a couple of nice studios before, we'd never, you know, punching in and editing using a razor blade, which is what they used yeah. to do with tape. You know, this was all that was all new to us. You know. Um, in fact, I, I just a very quick anecdote. Um, there was a piece of outboard equipment in the control room, and we were asking Kirschenbaum, like, what is what is that thing? A harmonizer? What does that do? And he said, Oh, it changes the pitch of an instrument in real time. And that was like, wow, this is 1978. So this yeah. was cutting edge. And he said, Yeah, he said, you know, you could, you could, it, like if something's out of tune, you could use that and just, you know, tweak it. And somebody said, well, if you put it on the vocal, could you make the vocal like out of tune or, or in tune or out of, and then, so, yeah, right, in tune. And then somebody said, well, what if it was already in tune? Could you make it out of tune? And we all laughed. Yeah. And Joe was going in to do a, a, a vocal part. And so we arranged to put the harmonizer on Joe's vocal and make it flat so that when he came in to listen back, <laughs> he would hear it. It was like a practical joke. You know? yeah. So he would sit down and listen, and that's what happened. So he came back in and he sat down and we were all trying so hard not to laugh, you know? And they played it back and it was just like painfully flat. Yeah. And we were all we're looking at Joe out of the corner of our eye. And, you know? and Joe's wondering why, how, how did this goes, happen? Whoa, fuck it out, I'm really <laughs> flat on this one. And we all just exploded. You know? And he looked at us and then he realized that we, and he, he was all pissed off and he ran out, he exited the studio. You know. So That's we never funny. did that again, but it was, it was funny at the time. <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah. So you guys, I mean, you, you guys were a, a hit here in the, in the States. I mean, crazy, like, you, you know, number, number one hits. Um, I'm, I'm sure touring, uh, you, you were headlining. On, on certain charts. I mean, we weren't number one on the Billboard Hot under and everything but i mean you know with the song the record the album i think was top 10 i think yeah. it, it was yeah we got a lot of huge amount of college radio play and um we yeah we did well and then the next time we came around we were playing bigger venues you know um and and um yeah it just it, it the, the 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 train kept rolling you know for uh for a while for a couple of years there that's great. I mean, what a what a great band, right? It was you guys. Was, you guys were high energy, killer, killer band. So, I know that there were a couple albums, maybe one album before Night and Day, that was sort of a transition album. Correct. But but um, Night and Day was, in in my view, was. Um, you know, sometimes when, when an artist makes makes a change in sort of style and presentation, it's a it's a complete flop. And night and day worked like I know. really, really worked nicely, like um jazz, Latin, um, rock and you know, rock, pop music. So different good songs. Charts, yeah, so different. So yeah, who would have thought? I actually thought it was commercial suicide. And I heard yeah. the demos, I thought these songs are really good, but this is taking a big leap of faith that your fans will follow you here. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't know if it would happen. And so tell us about, I mean. Well, Dave, the, the fabulous Dave Houghton, the drummer that you, that you admire so much, but that band lasted for three albums. Then Dave left the band for personal reasons. One of the reasons was actually um, stage fright. He yeah. suffered terribly from, performance anxiety just debilitating and he just you know and the trouble was we were playing to bigger and bigger audiences and uh, so it, it, it was getting worse and so he you know he left the band and we did uh, an album called Jump and Jive which was sort of like a digression Joe wanted to just have some fun and not find a replacement for Dave straight away so we did this 40s 50s jump blues yeah with with a with a horn section and no guitar player and 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 I really liked that album too you know yeah that was a lot of fun that, that was in fun. that was an album that where where my parents knew a lot of the songs you know I would play right, my right, my, right. my dad would be like oh that was a hit and you know forty forty seven right you know? yeah um that was a lot of fun to do that and and I I wondered exactly where, <clears throat> what was going to happen after that though because 
And then Joe was playing me these demos and I think these songs are great, but they, they were so very different from the first band. And there was no guitar and there were these Latin rhythms. And, you know, I, I, I really thought, wow, I, I wonder if anybody's gonna get this, you know? Maybe I kept having these very, I mean, I'm not a negative person by nature. I'm sure you could attest to that, mm. but I was thinking the party's over. Yeah. This is not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no one's gonna, no one's gonna dig this, you know? And so, but, but we still had a budget, we still had a record label and we recorded night and day in New York City. And um, we had some, a uh, couple of excellent percussionists on it to give it some off authenticity. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and then it came out and it just did incredibly well right from the get go. Was moving out the, the, the like Stepping the up. first, the, oh, I'm sorry, moving out, step it out. Mo moving out is Billy Joel. <laughs> <laughs> um, step it out, was that the first single or were there other singles that had come I out? I think it was the first single and they yeah. had a, they had a video as well. So this is also the beginning of the video age. Really. That's what I, I think. Great timing because the video is kind of um, kind of cute in a way. You know, the video video is user friendly, right? right. And the song the song was great. Yeah, and, I remember uh, I was upset that I wasn't in the video. Yeah, right. Yeah, but was this a moment where like you know you know it's just you and Joe? You were the nucleus of the of the band. I was the right? holdover, as the yeah the press like to say. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, it was a new band. It was a, yeah. a six-piece six piece band, five-piece yeah. six band. And um, yeah, it was very different. One, one of the, so we, we had a new drummer called Larry and Larry's also from my hometown and he was a great drummer and a, and a good friend. And I remember before we, we went to New York to record the Night and Day album, um, you know, Joe, we, we, we'd been toing and froing about the, the Latin influence on these songs. And Joe wanted us to be a little more familiar with, with, with the, 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 the Latin rhythms and the, the, you know, just the whole genre. And up to that effect, he, he sent, uh, this was in the days of the cassette tape, he sent a couple of cassette, uh, uh, cassettes to Larry and to me. Uh, 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 they were copies of an album called Understanding Latin Rhythms. <laughs> And it was all these people like, you know, like uh, Ray Barreto and Mongo Santa Maria and mm -hmm. Tito Puente playing the timbales, playing the congas. Um, Talk about the clave. Explaining and the, the different, the reverse right, clave. The mambo, the, yeah. Yeah, explaining the, the different roles of the instrument and, and how the, the, you know, the, the merengue and the cha-cha are, are different, you know. And we're listening to this and, and I, I remember, I, I, I'm thinking, I don't know if I can do this. The bass never hits one. Yeah. You know, I was like, oh my God, you know. So I was sitting at home listening. And I'm like, it was sort of something mystical about it. And then I finally, it like, it finally clicked. And I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. But I mean, you know, I think back on that. I think, well, I, I, you know, I'm like Joe had a, a, a an English bass player and an English drummer playing yeah. these, these kind of esoteric rhythms yes indeed. and there were like a thousand people in new york city that could have played the shit out of that yeah stuff and yet he he took a chance he had real latin percussionists yeah but he took a chance yeah he took a chance i guess because he knew what he wanted that's one thing with joe he's always known what he wanted so but it, and it worked so maybe also that um you know he i'm sure he knew that you could serve serve the song Right. I mean, it's one thing about getting a great musician, but you had been with him. You understood where he was coming from in terms of um, in terms of writing and so forth. So, you know, I, I wouldn't dismiss it. I wouldn't dismiss your presence, uh, you know. No, I don't yeah. dismiss it. I mean, I'm, of course, I'm very grateful for that loyalty as well. But I, and I think that he trusted. Yeah, right. Like you say, he trusted that I could interpret his wishes onto 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 tape you know yeah uh, and, it, and it did it, it worked out you know i mean uh yeah but it was a big it was a big change yeah it what a great a huge change i would recommend that if any of, of course all of joe's albums but um and primarily for for me as a drummer because they feature you 
and the bass is so prominent and Graham plays them plays uh, so musically and also serves the song, but night, night, night and day is just a great, it's fun to listen to. Uh, it's I, another I, great collection of songs. Yeah. I don't even think when, when I, when I, you know, I bought the album and, and listened to it and I remember the other albums I was listening to were like missing persons and you know, I don't know, you know, st stuff like that, like of of that time. It was still kind of rock. You know, was yes, still but but it didn't. It the night and day did not strike me as being odd or like uh, like a weird presentation. It just fell right into my collection. You know? Good. Well, I'm I'm yeah. glad that you say that. You know, I remember the, the 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 press jumped on the fact that there was no guitar. And yeah. Was, they sort of obsessed about that. Like didn't what, need it. What do you got? What do you got against guitar players? It Joe? didn't need it. You know. No, you know, he wasn't hearing it. So. Yeah, um, we have a lot. We could we could probably talk for hours, but I do want to talk about um, your your upcoming book. You have a you've yes. written a book, and well, uh, thank you. Yes, well, I haven't finished it yet, and actually, this is good. This is good that we're gonna we're gonna just mention it because. Uh, I think I need the motivation to finish the dance. Yeah, no, you tell us. I mean, tell us what you got so far. Tell well, us, I, or tell us what you're going for, or um, you know, um, it's it's just a memoir. But I, I, I'm, you know, I'm. I, I think I have some good stories to tell, and and there, there's there's stuff in there that probably people wouldn't. Well, you know, I I got the idea to write it after my mother died because when when my mom died. I, I had a couple of weeks with her while she was fading away from kidney problems. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was basically taking notes as she was reminding me about all these things that happened to her when she was an evacuee in London in the thirties at the beginning of the war and, and uh, you know, relocating to the South of England, you know, just, and I was, I, I, I wanted to write it all down for, for posterity. And yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed the process. And by the time I had written that down after she died, I thought, you know, I should do that because my life's been pretty interesting. And I imagine that my, if I have any descendants, you know, if my kids ever have kids, yeah. they might be interested. Absolutely. And um, so I started doing that and I, I did it rather in a rather boring kind of presenting the facts kind of way. And at some point I thought, you know, what if somebody were to read this that that didn't really know me very well, you know, like, how am I going to engage that person? Maybe I should try and make this a little more interesting in the way I'm presenting it and the way I'm writing it. And so I wrote a chapter with that in mind and all of a sudden it was really good fun. Yeah. yeah. Good. And so I, I basically had to go back and rewrite everything I'd written up to that point, you know, but, but it's just been a joy to do it. And if nothing comes of it, it's just been a pleasure to do it. Um, I'm, I'm probably about 85% through. Um, I've written, yeah, I've written a lot. And uh, it's, yeah, like I say, it's been, it's, been a, uh, it's been a joy. And I realize I've had a very charmed and, and pretty interesting life. Um, I, I'd say so. But I, but I have to say something else as well. You know, a, a few years ago, I was helping a relative move and that, you know, I was carrying a box of books, and on the top was a was Eric Clapton's uh, autobiography, and I, you know, so I said to my friend, "Did you read that book? You know, I bet it's interesting." And I remember they said, "Yeah, except for you know that all that stuff about when his kid dies, kind of a drag." Mm. And I remember thinking, "Well, you know, if you write the story of your life, there's going to be some." There's, it's not all going to be highs there's going to be yeah you know no i mean you know life life is tough yes. the happy bits yeah. are the bits you 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 that keep you moving forwards you mm -hmm. know but there's you know and so sure enough i mean i'm writing this book and there's some parts of my life that have been very uh, difficult to say but i mean everybody's life it's not yeah. just mine you know but uh, i you know you if, you if you're going to write a memoir you can't just cherry pick the good bits you know yeah you got to put it all in because it's all that's all it sounds all like there's in. um it's there's a catharsis right you're um but you're but you're fine you're not only finding your voice but you're but yes. you're um 
you know, it's well, I, I had to write, stuff is coming out, you know. Specifically, I had to write about about uh, my firstborn son's suicide in 1998. Oh my goodness, which which is still probably the most awful experience I've had to undergo. Not as uh, not as awful as his experience, but yeah. nonetheless, um, you know, uh, uh, what am I going to not write about that? You know, right. so, and I I also think that talking about that stuff is I don't know. It's useful for me to write about it. Maybe it's useful for someone else to read about it. I don't right. know. I hope so. Uh, I'll 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 say so. Graham, Graham, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, hold on. Still here. I I for some reason I lost you. Can you see me? Yeah. Nothing changed. Oh, darn yeah. it. Okay. Sorry about that. Um. Well, Graham, no, I I I definitely want to read this and um, I click something because I see that the meeting time is winding down. Um, okay. And, uh, but I, I did, I did want to touch on your book because I, I think, you know, this is, um, I, I've known you for some time, but I feel like we've taught, uh, uh, and, 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 and I mean this sincerely and genuinely, but, you know, if I've, every time you tell me some of these stories, I feel like I want to know more, you know, like I want to, I kind of want to be there, you know, uh, in, 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 in the, in the situation, you know, so, I, I would I, I would welcome a book and I would encourage you to finish it and and you you have a you have a lot to say and um, you certainly made made your mark as a musician as a world class musician and I kind of yeah. hate that kind kind of hate that term world class musician but you know no you're you're a freaking great great bass <laughs> player you know and I'm sure you've inspired a lot of drummers too you know to yeah. to play drums so. Um, well, I hope so. I feel like I feel like who who wouldn't want to read your book, you know, mm. we, and you know, with with all the stories in it, with all of the uh, life, with, with all of life's happenings, you know. Right, right, right. So, um, well, I'm 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 trying to make it so it's it's uh, it's a fun read that it's, yeah. um, you know, uh, uh, yeah. I'm just I'm 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 enjoying doing it, and I think. Uh, I've I've had a couple of uh, people reading it for me, like my wife and my daughter. Yeah, I encourage them to be brutally honest. And of course, they are. They're pretty brutally honest. Yeah, actually, which is good. And uh, you know, I, my goal at the moment is just to finish it because I feel like I've I've come this far. You know, so I yeah. just gotta, I just got to finish it. Well, we can't we can't wait wait to wait to read it. Can we? Let's let's put a part three on the books for sometime soon. And okay. We can, yeah, we can do we can that. Catch up. We can yeah. we could talk about some of the other artists you worked with after Joe. I also had in some notes here that we could talk about your role as a producer and, and you know how you how you know how that takes you out of that rhythm section function. You know. Yes. So yeah, um. Yes. Yeah. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna cap it off here, Graham. I want to thank you so much for for the, for this chat. This was amazing. I've really been looking forward to this. Good. Yeah, it was fun, Brian. It's always good to, to, to talk to you. Um, so we're going to say goodbye, Graham. And thanks again. And we'll we're see you soon. War. So, Graham, I'm just going to stop the recording. Okay. Bye.